Um, first topic under a regulatory framework subject, which is Anti-Money Laundering Act, or AMLA, uh, which was promulgated by Congress via Republic Act 9160, as amended by Republic Act 9194, Republic Act 10167, and Republic Act 10365. So if you uh, could remember under our, um, in our Diegler, you have already seen, uh, you already got a copy of the law, just the Anti-Money Laundering Act. But this particular um, lecture would deal on topics that are deemed to be relevant to your study as, uh, you know, as business students. So we will discuss the pertinent provisions of the Anti-Money Laundering Act and there will be certain cases that will serve as guidance or clarification and the proper application of the different provisions of the Anti-Money Laundering Act or AMLA. First would be the policy of the law. What was the intention of Congress when AMLA was passed or promulgated? Well, AMLA was passed by Congress in order to protect and preserve the integrity and confidentiality of bank accounts and to ensure that the Philippines shall not be used as a money laundering site for the proceeds of any unlawful activity. The first uh, policy of the AMLA was intended to make the Philippines a vibrant and a reliable uh, partner for international companies um, in terms of financial transactions, to make the Philippines a viable country for investors and to uplift um, our credit rating as well as our reputation in the financial sector because this um, would remove the Philippines from, you know, amongst countries that are blacklisted for dubious financial transactions. So the, the purpose of the AMLA really is to uplift the integrity and confidentiality of our bank accounts, meaning to promote the Philippines as an integral partner of international companies with respect to banking and financial transactions. And the second policy would be to pursue the state's foreign policy to extend cooperation and in transnational investigation and prosecutions of persons involved in money laundering activities wherever committed. It also make um, money laundering a, a criminal activity in the Philippines. And if foreign entities or foreign individuals would go to the Philippines and commit money laundering, they can no longer say that, you know, uh, they are not liable for money laundering, considering that we penalize this money laundering based on the provisions of the Anti-Money Laundering Act or AMLA. Now, for um, AMLA purposes, we have institutions or persons deemed to be responsible to do something, which is to report to the Anti-Money Laundering Council. We call these um, uh responsible entities or individuals as covered institutions under the original law. But the covered institutions term was changed to covered persons under Republic Act 10365. The reason for the changing under Republic Act 10365 is to expand now the term covered institutions because covered institutions would limit only to corporations and other juridical entities. But with covered persons now as the proper term duly amended, it now covers both natural or juridical entities, meaning it's no longer limited to juridical entities such as corporations. Individuals now are also considered as covered persons under the Anti-Money Laundering Act. So under the covered persons um, enumerated under Section 3A of the original law, which is Republic Act 9160 as amended, they include banks, non-banks, quasi-banks, trust entities, foreign exchange dealers, pawn shops, money changers, remittance and transfer companies, and other similar entities, and all other persons and their subsidiaries and affiliated, supervised, or regulated by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. Obviously, um, the first item that will be considered as covered persons would be those entities that are regulated by the Banco Central ng Pilipinas because these are real entities with massive cash transactions. The flow of cash amongst these institutions would be the most numerous in, in different and in amongst all industries. So for banks and non-banks or quasi-banks, definitely they're handling other people's money 
trust entities or also accept, they also accept monies from other from from depositors and from investors as well as dealers of foreign exchange currencies and pawn shops now second covered persons would be the insurance companies pre-need companies and other persons supervised or regulated by the insurance commission others will include securities dealers brokers salesmen investment houses and other similar persons managing securities or rendering services an investment agent advisor or consultant covered persons also include mutual funds closed and investment companies common trust funds and other similar persons and other entities administering or otherwise dealing in currency commodities or financial derivatives common denominator of all these three mentioned under item three would be that they deal with currency they accept currency from individuals whether as a form of securities whether as a form of investment or mutual funds or dealing with currency so if there is an involvement of cash acceptance of cash then they will be considered as covered institutions under under the anti-money laundering act also included amongst the enumeration in section 3a for covered persons would be jewelry dealers in precious metals who in as part of their business or trade in precious metals the transactions would exceed 1 million pesos similar also for jewelry dealers in precious stones again as part of their business or trade with transactions exceeding 1 million pesos we also include company service providers that that act as formation agent of juridical persons meaning they uh, prov uh act as agent for uh, individuals or persons wanting to form corporations in the philippines or those acting as a director or corporate secretary of a company partner or partnership or a similar position in relation to other juridical persons and those providing a registered office business address or accommodation correspondence or administrative address for a company partnership or any other legal person or arrangement and lastly would be those acting as a nominee shareholder for any other person why do we include them as part of the covered persons it's because when they act for um, as agent for formation of certain corporations they would be a certain involvement of cash transactions or they could be served or they could serve as dummies for certain cash transactions including uh, that would involve corporations that in a way will skirt now the real intention or the real purpose for which these tra cash transactions may have risen meaning the, these uh, service providers are in a way will serve as front now to hide the true source of these cash transactions which is the very purpose of lo money laundering right also included in the definition of covered persons would be those persons who provide the, the any of the following services management of client money securities or other assets you mga wealth managers organization of contributions for the creation operation or management of companies and the creation, operation, or management of juridical persons or arrangements in buying and selling of business entities, right? So you note, you take note of the particular law class, which is RA 9160. You'll see there the enumeration of the covered institutions. It should be amended already as covered persons by RA 10365, right? Now let's proceed to um, the exclusion. Note that for covered persons, we will not include lawyers and accountants. These persons who are acting as an independent legal professional or as an independent accounting professional in relation to the information concerning their clients or where disclosure of information would compromise the client confidences or the much vaunted attorney-client relationship. So it's because lawyers' class are bound by the attorney-client relationship it would be impossible for lawyers now to be required by the Anti-Money Laundering Council to report certain information with respect to their clients, even if these information may include now uh, currency, bank transactions, or financial transactions that are well within the ambit of the Anti-Money Laundering Act. It's because lawyers and, and their profession, lawyering and accounting profession, rely on the very much foundation of trust and confidence with its clients. 
So if clients now would be fearsome with respect to these professionals reporting their financial transactions to the Anti-Money Laundering Council, then basically the Anti-Money Laundering Act is undermining the very foundation and the very existence of these professions. So for lawyers and accountants, they are not included as part of the covered person's definition under Section 3, Paragraph A. But note that in order for, the law for lawyers and accountants to be excluded, the following requisites must be present. First, that these professionals must be acting independently. Now, for a lawyer, he must be an independent legal professional, not an employee of that particular corporation or not an employee of that particular person. Kung employee siya, then he is not an independent legal professional or independent accounting professional, then the exclusion will not apply. Say, for example, you are the legal counsel, uh, you are the in-house lawyer or counsel of that company, then you, as, 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 as a company, the company is included amongst the covered person, then that lawyer will be considered as a covered person as well and responsible to report it to the AMLAC or the anti money Laundering Council, he cannot later on, um, you know, argue that I'm a lawyer. I'm not covered by that incident because you are not acting as an independent legal counsel. Second, the accountant or the lawyer must be authorized to practice in the Philippines and must continue to be subject to the provisions of the respective codes of conduct and their professional responsibility and any of its amendments. Note that both the legal profession and the accounting profession are governed by their own code of professional responsibility or code of ethics. Okay. And if you continuously be part or be covered by that one, then you are covered by um, um, this particular exclusion. But note that lawyers and accountants must act as an independent professionals. And if they act as independent professionals, they are not required to report covered and suspicious transactions. If the relevant information was obtained in such circumstance, which is in under an attorney-client relationship, right? Because you are vowed by secrecy you are not uh, you cannot be forced by any law to spill the secrets of our clients it's because that would undermine the very foundation of the profession otherwise then no one would basically trust now the lawyers and accountants and basically everyone now every lawyer and accountant would find it very difficult to get clients right now let's proceed to the obligations of these covered institutions or covered persons first is customer identification. Covered persons now must first establish and record the true identity of its clients based on official documents. Second is to maintain a system of verification of the true identity of the clients. And in case of corporate clients, covered persons now should require a system of verifying their legal existence and organizational structure. Note that prior to AMLA class, it has been a practice for many high-profile um, individuals to open bank accounts under a pseudonym or an alias. If you remember, during the hearing or the, the impeachment trial of President Estrada, he was actually accused of opening now multi-million dollar accounts and multi-million peso accounts with Equitable PCI Bank then, now Banco de Oro or BDO, Universal Bank, under the name of Jose Pedal. And that's an alias. He actually has specimen signatures as well as Jose Pedal in order for him to control that particular bank account. But the passage now of the Anti-Money Laundering Act would probably make it impossible now to create um, bank accounts under um, aliases. Unless, of course, if managers of, of these banking institutions would you know, fraudulently create uh, fictitious accounts in order to commit fraud. But other than that, if you are a legitimate depositor, you can you, you will not you will no longer or you will find it impossible now or difficult to open a bank account under in an alias, considering that AMLA requires now covered persons, including banks, quasi banks, and other financial institutions, to establish customer identification, to identify their customers, and to establish a system whether automated or whether a manual system, as long as this system is designed to, uh, to prevent now aliases and fictitious identities to enter into the banking system and create bank accounts. And that's the first obligation. 
Now, anonymous accounts, accounts under fictitious names, and all other similar accounts are now prohibited under the Anti-Money Laundering Act. Peso and foreign currency non-checking numbered accounts, however, shall be applied. I shall be allowed, rather. Now, the Banco Central ng Pilipinas may conduct audits, random audits with banking institutions, random audits for, say, rural banks, universal banks, or commercial banks. The Banco Central ng Pilipinas will do a random audit in order to determine if there will, there will be um, fictitious or alias accounts existing in the banking system. So for banks now, it would be you know, impossible or they will be risking their integrity and their, um, how should I say this, their um, reputation with the Banco Central ng Pilipinas should they allow now um, bank accounts under fictitious names and aliases to be open because in one way or another it can be disclosed by it can be disclosed through these random audits the second obligation of a covered person would be to um rec to keep records all right record keeping now um record keeping would um involve now the recording of all transactions of covered institutions and and for the covered persons to maintain these records for five years from the date of transactions. Note that for banks and, and, and if, if a particular account is closed, the records shall be preserved by that bank and safety store that particular information on all other um, transactions for at least five years from the date they were closed. So apart from maintaining that one five years from the date of the transactions, the bank must also safe keep closed accounts of five years from the date that the, these particular accounts were closed. The third obligation is to report the covered and suspicious transactions. Covered persons shall report these covered and suspicious transactions to the Anti-Money Laundering Council within five working days from the occurrence thereof. The AMLAC prescribes a different period, but um, but this period that AMLAC will provide should not exceed 15 working days. So it's possible that the reporting may be prescribed by AMLAC, say, within 10 days, and the bank will follow that one. It, it's not the usual five days, but the five days prescribed by AMLAC will prevail, but that, pre but that prescription of AMLAC for additional days should not exceed 15 working days. Note that under the AMLAC, it's working days, not simply days. So basically, it has to be Mondays to Fridays. Because there are certain laws class that says 15 days. And if say 15 days, it will cover Saturday and Sunday, even a holiday. But if the mention is working days, then it has to be a working day. Note that a transaction may be determined to be both covered and suspicious transaction the covered institution shall be required to report to report the same as a suspicious transaction. If just so happen a covered siya class, but in, and it so, so happen a suspicious din siya, then it should be reported as suspicious kasi mas, mas may red flag ang suspicious transaction over covered transaction. Okay? Now, there will be no liability in reporting covered and suspicious transactions. Now, individuals... Uh, working for covered persons, juridical persons, their officers and employees shall not be deemed to have violated now the law on secrecy of bank de deposits, the Foreign Currency Deposit Act, the general banking laws, and other similar laws. Because again, the AMLAC or the AMLA, the Anti-Money Laundering Act, requires them to do so under the pain of penalty okay, and other forms of punishment under this particular law. So it is their responsibility and therefore should they comply with the responsibility to report covered and suspicious transactions to the council, then these officers and employees shall be deemed not to have violated any other similar provision, especially the provision and the bank secrecy laws. All right. Also, the officers and employees of covered persons are not allowed class to communicate directly or indirectly in any manner or by any means to any person, the fact that a covered or suspicious transaction was made and the contents thereof or any other information in relation thereto. Reporting now covered or suspicious transactions by these covered institutions or covered persons to the council 
must be done without any funfair, without informing anyone, even the parties themselves or the media. If reporting is done by any person in the regular performance of its duties in good faith, no administrative, criminal, or civil proceeding shall lie against said person, whether or not such reporting results in any criminal prosecution under this act. This is what we call the safe harbor, harbor provision. Under the safe harbor provision, say the reporting was made to the AMLAC, and the AMLAC filed cases now against the person um, involved or the person under whose account the covered or suspicious transactions um, have, have, you know, have risen. Now, if this particular transaction were reported to the AMLAC, you know, and, and it resulted to um, a litigation or a, a case against that particular person, the reporting entity, including its officers or employees, shall not be subject to any administrative, criminal, or civil proceedings. The person now to whom the uh, suspicious or covered transactions belong may no longer cannot claim later on of damages that there's business reputation and filing cases against those individuals who reported uh, the transactions to AMLA. This has safe harbor provision basically remove now any liability from any officers or employees of these covered persons or covered institutions who reported this to the AMLAC. Okay. There is also a prohibition to communicate directly or indirectly in any means the fact that covered or suspicious transactions have been reported, uh, the contents thereof to and any other re uh, relation thereto, and publishing or airing in any manner or form by the mass media, electronic mail, or other similar devices. Note that in case of violation of these prohibitions, the con concerned officer and employee of the covered persons and the media shall be held criminally liable. This is provided by Section 7 of Republic Act 10365, uh, amending now Section 9 of the AMLA. So Section 9 was amended with the provision of these criminal liability for both officers and employees who, who made the communication directly or indirectly and the media entity as well as the media personnel who did the outing or the release of such information that the certain covered or suspicious transactions were indeed reported to the AMLA. All right. Now, let's discuss the covered transactions because we've already listened to um, the, the previous topics and we always mention covered transactions, suspicious transactions. So what is a covered transaction, by the way? A transaction in cash or other equivalent monetary instrument involving a total amount in excess of 500,000 pesos within one banking day is considered to be a covered transaction. So if within one banking day, um, there was a transaction in your bank account amounting to um, more than 500,000 pesos, it means 501,000 pesos and above, then the covered person, say the bank, will have to report this transaction to the AMLA. Do you automatically be liable for Anti-Money Laundering Act? No, you're not liable. But obviously, your names, your records will reach the AMLAC, the Anti-Money Laundering Council. And the Anti-Money Laundering Council will then track now reports to be made subsequently if, if these report of covered transactions would create a certain pattern. And this certain pattern now may establish now a probable cost for Anti-Money Laundering Council to conduct an investigation against your bank accounts and against your financial transactions. But if wala naman makitang uh, pattern or walang makitang any probable cost of suspicious activities for, for these covered transactions, walang gagawin ng AMLAC. But again, if, if a certain transaction exceeds 500,000, within one business day, covered persons will have to report this to the AMLAC as a covered transaction. But the second would be suspicious transactions. These are transactions with covered persons or covered institutions. Regardless of the amount involved, will any of the following circumstances exist? For suspicious transactions, it does not require that the particular amount should exceed 500,000. It could be lower than 500,000. It could be as low as 10,000 or 20,000. But what make these transactions class um, suspicious would be the attendance of certain circumstances. The first circumstance would be no underlying legal or trade obligation, purpose, or economic justification. 
If you open a bank account, the bank will always ask you where the money comes from. The money comes from as an allowance or a support from your family or you're working. There is an income generating activity. Or was this from a business? Because the bank has to convince itself that the particular amount of cash coming into your account and moving out of your account, these cash transactions are because of a certain legal trade or business. Or there was an obligation by a certain individual to provide money for you. Or there was an economic justification. Maybe you receive certain economic benefits from certain investments. Therefore, the source of these cash amounts entering into your bank account will have to be explained uh, by the banking institution. If these are not explained and there are no basis now for an economic a transaction or economic justification and these significant amounts of money are coming into your bank account and you are not of a certain working age or you're basically retired but the amount of money are coming in and these are not explained that will make the particular transaction suspicious because this is a suspicious circumstance okay the non ex the cannot explain the economic justification for these financial transactions Second is when the client is not properly identified. When there is obviously a, a, an error or there was obviously a, um, uh, what do you call that, one thing of additional information to uh, verify the veracity of the identification of that particular customer or particular uh, account holder. And there are transactions coming into his bank account and, and that seems that the identity is dubious, then that will make the transaction suspicious. Another suspicious transaction will be the amount involved is not commensurate with the business or financial capacity of the client, meaning the client's income level is this, and the amount of money coming into his bank accounts are so massive, then there is now a suspicious activity involving these transactions that there is a high possibility that while this person's, this person's profession or uh, in public will not translate into this kind of income, there could be dubious activities or criminal activities where this money comes from, right? And to take another suspicious transaction will be when you take into account all known circumstances, it may be perceived that the client's transaction is structured in order to avoid being subject of reporting requirements under the Act. When it is already obvious and there is already a pattern that the particular transactions are being sent on a daily basis, but it doesn't exceed or they don't exceed 500000 just to make sure that these transactions will not will not be uh, will not fall under covered transactions but there is already a clear pattern that the sending of these amounts less than 500,000 on a daily basis is a, is a clear skirting of the requirements under the amla then that will make the, these transactions suspicious Another is when circumstances relating to the transaction, which is observed to deviate from the profile of the client and the client's past transactions with the covered institution. When the transactions is in a way related to an unlawful activity or offense under the AMLA that is about to be, is being, or has been committed, and any transactions that is similar or analogous to any of the following. Note that if the particular financial transactions are coupled with unlawful activities or offense or any, any suspicious of involvement into a certain felony or criminal activity or unlawful activity, these financial transactions will be deemed suspicious transactions. And obviously, the catch-all provision, which, which would include now similar or analogous transactions. Okay? Now, let's proceed to how money laundering is committed. Now, money laundering is committed by any person who, knowing that any monetary instrument or property represents, involves, or relates to the proceeds of any unlawful activity. In money laundering, you transact the said monetary instrument or property, and then you convert, transfers, disposes, or moves, acquires, or possesses, or uses the monetary instrument or property. And then you conceal now or disguises the true nature, the source, the location, disposition, movement of ownership, or the rights with respect to said monetary instrument or property, and then attempts or conspires to commit money laundering offenses, referring to in paragraphs A, B, or C under Section 4 of Republic Act 9160. Now, in, in, in the concealment of the true nature and source of uh, this particular monetary instrument, these 
Uh, there are also individuals who attempts or conspires to commit money laundering offenses or aids, abets, assists in, or counsels the commission of the money laundering offenses and performs or fails to perform any act as the result of which the facilitation of the offense of money laundering um, referred to in, such, uh, in paragraphs A, B, or C of section 4. So note that money laundering must be committed by a principal, which is the one who did the money laundering, by a um, one who works with that principal, who attempts to conspire with that principal to commit money laundering, money laundering, and of course, one who assists, aids, or abets, um, or counsels, meaning a lawyer who advises an individual to launder a uh, certain money or money monetary instrument, then they are all committing money laundering. So it's not limited only to that person actually laundering money, but we include also his accessories, all right? Um, his accessories, uh, the lawyer who, who counsels him on doing that, they are all parties to the money laundering. But in GIST class, you notice that money laundering is basically cleaning the money. These would money come from unlawful activities, criminal activities. So basically, these are dirty money. And by laundering it, you're basically concealing now the true nature of this money. You are concealing now the true source of this money. And then you acquire certain businesses or certain transactions. You pass through these money through these entities. They report it legally. Um, through the, the Bureau of Internal Revenue and basically legitimizing that income. But that income may come from unlawful activities, but you make it appear that that particular income has been generated through a legitimate business or trade. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is cleaning the money. Instead of money coming from a criminal activity, it would come out now, albeit you have to pay taxes, but since you recognize it legitimate, legitimately, using now your legitimate businesses, but nevertheless, you're actually legitimizing that money. And the legitimate money now can be used to acquire legitimate businesses, properties, and basically now re removing now these dirty money from its previous origin and, and removing now any possibility of tracking now these money coming from unlawful activities to where it is now because they're already transformed into legitimate forms like businesses, real estate properties, and other legitimate investments. Okay? Money laundering is also committed by any person who, knowing that a covered or suspicious transaction is required under the AMLA to be reported to the AMLA, fails to do so. Meaning if you're a covered person, your officers or employees know that you are a covered person and you're required to submit this information but refuse to submit that information, albeit knowing, or even if you don't know that these are covered or suspicious transactions, now these covered persons will have to be considered as well as part of money laundering. They are also liable in committing money laundering, even if they are not directly partic direct participants of the money laundering activity. All right? Now let's proceed to the Anti-Money Laundering Council or the AMLA. The Anti-Money Laundering Council class is comprised of the governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas or the BSP, serving now as the chairman of the AMLA. And then, of course, the commissioner of the Insurance Commission as member and the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission as well as a member. So there are two members and a chair for the Anti-Money Laundering Council. Now, the functions now of the Anti-Money Laundering Council would include the requirement and, of course, the reception of covered or suspicious transactions to be submitted by the covered persons. Second is to issue ad orders addressed to the appropriate supervising authority um, or the covered institutions to determine now the true identity of the owner of the monetary instrument or property that are subject uh, of a covered transaction or suspicious transaction report. Or a request for assistance from a foreign state say the Interpol or any other foreign um, jurisdictions agency implementing now or uh, criminal, uh, you know, implementing now the fight against money laundering or any criminal activity for that matter, the AMLAC will have to work with them hand in hand to provide them with assistance on the basis for substantial evidence to be in whole or in part um, uh, where located, representing, involving, or related to the directly or indirectly in any manner, by any means, the proceeds of an unlawful activity. The AMLAC will also institute civil forfeiture proceedings and all other judicial remedial proceedings through the Office of the Solicitor General. 
and to cause the filing of complaints with the Department of Justice are the ombudsman for the prosecution of money laundering offenses and also to investigate suspicious transactions and uncovered transactions deemed suspicious after investigation by the AMLA, money laundering activities, and other violations of this act. The AMLOC is also responsible to apply before the Court of Appeals an ex parte petition, right? If you say ex parte, you doesn't have to notify the other party. You can already apply the petition before the Court of Appeals as the petitioner alone. No need to notify the other party in an ex parte petition. For the freezing of any monetary instrument or property alleged to be laundered, proceeds from or, or instrumentalities used in or intended for use in any unlawful activity as defined in Section 3I hereof. Also, to implement such measures as may be necessary and justified under this Act to counteract money laundering and to receive and take action in respect of any request from foreign states for assistance in their own anti-money laundering operations provided under this Act. The AMLAC shall also develop educational programs on the pernicious effects of money laundering. That's why the AMLAC spearheads now a campaign drive, symposia, seminars, and fora uh, involving anti-money laundering activities. Because it is also the duty of the AMLAC to develop educational programs and to inform the public that these are the forms of money laundering, these are penalized under the law, and in order to uh, disseminate okay, the, the information to the public, to tell them that this is wrong, this is a criminal activity. And also to in, enlist the assistance of any branch, department, bureau, office, agency, or any instrumentality of the government, including GOCCs, in undertaking any and all anti-money laundering operations which may include the use of its personal facilities, resources, uh, for the more resolute prevention, detection, and investigation of money laundering offenses. Note that because the Anti-Money Laundering Council is a tiny agency or a tiny institution, what the, this particular law does is to empower the AMLAC now to deputize now the employees and personnel of different agencies of the government, including GOCCs, to carry out now the anti-money laundering operations, the fight of, of the AMLAC against money laundering. And of course, another function of the AMLAC is to impose administrative sanctions for violations of certain laws, rules, and regulations, and orders and resolutions issued by the AMLAC, and to require the Land Registration Authority and all its re registries of deeds to submit the AMLAC reports and all real estate transactions involving an amount in excess of 500,000 pesos within 15 days from the date of registration of the transaction in a form to be prescribed by the AMLAC. The AMLAC may also require the LRA and all its registries of deeds to submit copies of relevant documents of all real estate transactions. Now let's proceed to the freezing of monetary instrument or property. Note that there is now a power to issue now a freeze order against the monetary instrument or properties of those individuals found to be suspicious or those individuals with suspicious transactions or involved in any unlawful activity. So when does freeze order may be issued? First is when the AMLAC through the Office of the Solicitor General files a verified ex parte or one party petition before the Court of Appeals. And second, when the Court of Appeals determines if probable cause exists that any monetary instrument or property is any way related to an unlawful activity as defined in Section 3, Paragraph I hereof. Okay? So note first that there must be a verified petition. Bef uh, before the Court of Appeals filed by the Office of Solicitor General in behalf of the AMLAC. And then, after filing that petition, the Court of Appeals found a probable cause that there is actually a monetary instrument that is related to an unlawful activity. If these two requisites are, are present, then a freeze order may be issued. Note that the Court of Appeals is a sole court or the sole body that has the authority to issue a, a, a freeze order of the monetary instruments or properties in relation to an unlawful activity under the AMLA. It also has the ex exclusive jurisdiction to extend the existing freeze orders that were previously issued by the AMLA vis-a-vis accounts and deposits related to money laundering activities. This was ruled by the Supreme Court in the case of Republic versus Cabrini, Green, and Ramos. 
Now note class that the probable cost under the AMLA has two phases and it includes facts and circumstances which would lead a reasonably discreet, prudent or cautious man to believe that an unlawful activity and, or any money, money laundering offense is about to be, is being or has been committed and that the account or any other man, monetary instrument or property subject thereof sought to be frozen is in any way related to said unlawful activity or any money laundering offenses, right? So there, the, the, the probable cause that we're talking about would include facts and circumstances that would convince now um, a reasonably discreet, prudent, or cautious man that there, there in fact has an unlawful activity. It should be in a sense convincing that a cautious person will be convinced na ay, meron ng unlawful activity. And who will have that, um, that probable cost? First, the AMLAC. The, um, the council will have a probable cost that there is an unlawful activity. And then if the AMLAC is convinced that there is an unlawful activity, then it will file a verified petition. And then once the petition is filed, it is now the Court of Appeals that has to establish the probable cause. The Court of Appeals will have to, cons to convince itself that there is a probable cause that an unlawful activity has been committed in relation to this monetary instrument or property in order for the Court of Appeals to issue the freeze order. All right? This is provided under Republic Act 9194 as amended by Rule 10.2 of the remedial laws. Now, the remedy of a person whose account has been frozen is to file a motion to lift the, the freeze order and the court must resolve this motion before the expiration of the freeze order. Because obviously, it will be moot and academic if the freeze order has already expired to file a motion to lift. Because what is to lift now? Wala nang motion to. Wala nang freeze order to begin with. So obviously, since the motion or the, the motion, uh, the freeze order rather is still active, <coughs> or still, I know, it's still available, then the person affected should file a motion before the Court of Appeals to lift this one. However, there is no court that, that can issue a temporary restraining order or a writ of injunction against the freeze order issued by the Court of Appeals except the Supreme Court. So only the Supreme Court can issue a TRO or a writ of injunction against the freeze order issued by the CA, and which is true because the hierarchy of courts provided that the Supreme Court is higher than the Court of Appeals. Note, class, that the freeze order is an extraordinary remedy issued by the Court of Appeals, and this was intended to prevent the dissipation, removal, or disposal of properties that are suspected to be the proceeds of related to or unlawful activities as defined in Section 3, Paragraph I of RA 9160 as amended. The primary objective of this freeze order is to temporarily preserve the monetary instruments or property that are in a way related to that unlawful activity. This was um, um, reiterated by the Supreme Court in the case of Ligot versus Republic. Right. Now, the effectivity of the freeze order. The freeze order may be extended by the Court of Appeals for a period not exceeding six months. However, it should become completely necessary for the Republic to further extend the duration of the freeze order. It should file the necessary motion before the expiration of the six-month period and explain the reason or the reasons for its failure to file an appropriate case and justify the period of extension. Note that Section 10 of AMLA uses specific language to authorize ex parte application for the provisional relief of the freeze order. Nothing in Section 11 of the same law authorizes an ex parte application for the issuance of an order to examine bank accounts. Right? So consequently, courts receiving an application for inquiry order cannot simply take AMLA's words that the probable cost exists that the deposits or investments are related to an unlawful activity. Therefore, a separate hearing must be done in order for, for, the, for AMLA or for any other institution, for the AMLA rather, to uh, obtain now a, a bank inquiry order separate from the freeze order, right? Now let's proceed to the authority to inquire into bank deposits. The AMLA class may also inquire into or examine any particular deposit or investment, including related accounts with any banking institution or non-bank financial institutions. 
provided, however, that it is an, upon an order of a competent court, meaning there is a court order. It is based on an ex parte application, meaning AMLAC filed for that application. And in case of violations of this act, when it has been established that there is probable cost, that the deposits or investments, including related accounts related to an unlawful activity hereof, a money laundering offense under Section 4 hereof. So therefore, in order for, for um, AMLAC to inquire into the bank accounts of, you know, suspected individuals, it has to have, it has to obtain a bank inquiry or order from a corporate competent court. The inquiry conducted by the AMLAC is not violative of the law on secrecy of bank deposits as amended, Foreign Currency Deposit Act or RA 6426 as amended, the general banking laws and other similar laws. The Court of Appeals shall act on the application for the bank inquiry order uh, uh, if, if such um, investigation or examination shall be done with any banking institution or non-bank financial institution within 24 hours from the filing of such application. So this is the end now of our first topic on Anti-Money Laundering Act. Again, I would encourage everyone to read the entirety of the law, but this particular lecture is a guidance of the coverage of what are the pertinent provisions of the law. And I will also up upload uh, a PDF version uh, for this particular lecture or presentation.